does anybody know what international year it is this year? Pulses, yes, isn't that exciting? <laughs> I was in a conference this weekend with a lot of breeders and uh, they are, I have to uh, assure you, quite excited about the fact that they can, they can bring their uh, chickpeas and their beans and their lentils, uh, et cetera, into the, into the limelight. But do you know that we just concluded the international year of? Soils. Soils, and I think it was high time for that underrated actor in the uh, food system to step into the spotlight. USC Canada champions the first link uh, in the food chain, seeds, those tiny packets of enormous potential that if sufficient, diverse, and adapted, keep human beings on this planet alive and well-fed. So we've labeled our global program seeds of survival, but when you think about it some more, it's the soil with its armies of microorganisms and nutrients just below the surface that bring those little packets of, of potential to life. We should probably call the lovely brown earth that gets under our, our fingernails in the spring the first link in the food chain. But then again, there's the sun and the water that drops from the skies and melts from the glaciers to run deep beneath those soils. And what about the expert hands of the farmers that plant those seeds, harvest that water, and nurture those soils? Truth be told, it is their intimate dance that makes the system work on our behalf, the interdependent web of all existence of which we are a part. If we're going to handle the increasingly unpredictable weather events and climate extremes, we had better pay careful attention to the entire in interconnected food production system and more particularly to the human experts in that wonderful dance, the small-scale family farmer. And that for me is what the concept of resilience is essentially all about. The way everything is interconnected, an amazing and highly complex arrangement with each part needing to be respected each part needing to be nurtured, but most importantly, each part needing each other. Family farmers who farm with what nature, Mother Nature has to offer know this truth only too well, and if only more policymakers understood how resilience works. I, I first started to think about resilience theory about, and I'm giving my age away again, 18-ish years ago, when I took a graduate course on sustainable development with Kenton Love over there, uh, with Dr. Fikrit Burkus from the University of Manitoba, Dr. Burkus argued that resilience thinking is a must if we're going to uh, build sustainable development. And resilience thinking did prove central to my uh, studies with indigenous farmers in the Bolivian Andes and has since become central to the work of my organization, USC Canada, uh, formerly known as Unitarian Service Committee, for those of you who are curious about those three letters. And the reason I especially like this concept is that it, I believe, is a hopeful alternative to the more pejorative concept of poverty. With resilience thinking, you don't start by looking at what's lacking, the deficit, the hole that needs to be filled, but rather at what is there. And there's plenty of resilience to discover if we look carefully. So just a few words about my take on resilience theory before I share some of what the indigenous farmers I studied alongside in the year 2000 taught me about resilience and more importantly about some of the do's and don'ts if we want to strengthen resilience. And then I'll share with you briefly the story of Can USC Canada's Seeds of Survival program. And in so doing, I hope, offer ways of um, supporting the resilience or suggesting ways that we can support the resilience of small scale or peasant farmers who actually feed the overwhelming majority of us on this planet, at least 70% if we consider pastoralists, hunters, gatherers, and fishers. And that was recently quoted, quoted in The Economist, a January 15, 2016 uh, edition. 
Did you know that 85% of the world's, uh, the food that the world consumes today actually comes from what we call <coughs> close circuit markets, meaning within our borders, within our communities, within our regions. So the large industrial farms that are supposed to be essential to our capacity to feed cities actually are not the primary sustainers of life on this planet. A quote to begin. All effects we observe in the world of experience are interrelated in the most constant manner and merge into one another. From the first to the last, they form a series of undulations. These were the words of philosopher, scientist, poet, and I would add pioneer ecologist. Any guesses? From a long time ago. <laughs> Who? Sorry? No, Goethe. Goethe challenged his uh, fellow citizens to consider nature and humanity's role within it as <coughs> dynamic, interconnected, and ever-changing web of activity. So our Cartesian hurry to order and compartmentalize nature's component parts clearly had its critics early on. So resilience theory is rooted in a well-established history of, of systems thinking and complexity theory. One of the first definitions uh, of resilience came from ecologist uh, Buzz or C.S. Halling in the early 1970s. Resilience, he suggested, is the ability of a system to adapt to change and disturbance while still remaining within a critical threshold. There must be built-in options and enough redundancy or, or fat in the system to better respond to stressors. So it's correctly uh, associated with diversity, inter and intra-species diversity, to enhance, that enhances an ecosystem's capacity to withstand shocks and surprises, and if damaged, to rebuild itself. Disturbances within a system, of course, aren't only generated um, through natural occurring events or, or through like forest fires and insect outbreaks, but ones we humans contribute to like pollution or, or overfishing. And that's where a term called socio-ecological uh, resilience, or, and I would add community resilience, enters the picture. So it's the idea that a natural system's responses to resource use and the reciprocal response of people to changes in the natural ecosystems constitute these dynamic coupled uh, Dr. Burkus refers to as nested systems that exhibit adaptive behavior. The emphasis here is on the notion of how social cohesion and a society's ability to innovate build resilience. So resilience isn't just about bouncing back, rolling with the punches um, as it's often described. It's also about the capacity to learn and the capacity to innovate in order to adapt. So that when one path, one approach, one opportunity is blocked, you need new creative ideas about moving forward. And if you do get to that critical threshold without options, uh, well, uh, as ecologists put it, a flip can happen, which shifts the system into a state that's less desirable, often irre irreversible and unrecognizable. So social systems, of course, have critical thresholds tipping points, when even that smallest sort of proverbial straw that broke the camel's back can flip a system over the brink and into a new reality. And I think one of our clearest examples of a human-induced <coughs> flip is uh, the cod uh, fishery off the North Atlantic coast. Because not only did the fishing industry collapse, villages were emptied and even the survival of the codfish is in question. I would suggest that when a community resource, like cod or, or an agricultural crop for that matter, becomes a diffuse global commodity, exploited in huge volumes in an effort to gain that competitive advantage, the idea of an uncaught fish being a lost opportunity, you ignore declining stocks until they're quite visibly threatened. The community resource becomes an industrial commodity, not only divorced from its place in the natural environment, but divorced from its role in building a thriving community and culturally important enterprise. 
So the social, political, cultural context within which change takes place is central to um, the resilience of institutions and communities. And so too are the knowledge systems and worldviews that influence human interaction with the environment. Have any of you heard of Princeton ecologist Simon Levin? He uh, developed um, a kind of list of, he called them the Eight Commandments of Managing Complex Ecosystems. And I found that particularly useful um, for my research with indigenous potato farmers in the Bolivian highlands. So I borrowed from it and I adapted um, his commandments to develop a kind of community resilience lens with nine key interconnected characteristics. The idea being that resilience isn't a state that's arrived at, but rather a dynamic set of conditions. I'm not going to go through each of these um, today because I want to make sure we have enough time to have a good dialogue afterwards. But when you turn each of these characteristics up there into a question, you begin to understand the capacity to change without compromising one's identity and integrity. For example, is the community or an organization or a farm, for that matter, acting in ways that reduce uncertainty and risk? Carefully reading and monitoring both internal and external forces that can affect its status? Or is the community designed in such a way that the component parts have some independence? Because sustaining modularity within a system which, which actually means the independent components, they're interlinked, of course, but may be disconnected when necessary, can be a very critical element in a resilient system. Modular structures can um, be a, a good buffering against the idea of cascades of disaster. And community institutions, likewise, um, have a better chance of survival if they're multifaceted and, and decentralized. So, I'm going to ask you, if you're interested, and I have some books over there, um, to turn to the book if you're still curious to, to learn more about the full list of questions I would propose we ask. But let me just mention one more that Levin and um, ecologists in general don't seem to address adequately, at least not in the literature that I've reviewed, and that is the question of power. Is a community willing to share knowledge and to address the issues of control and, and ownership in inclusive ways? So you'll be happy to know that that's the theory for today. <laughs> and now I'm going to get into um, more on, on you know, examples of my experience with farmers in the Andes. I had uh, already worked uh, in the international rural development field for about 15 years um, when I headed to their highlands. But I have to say, uh, and I had taken courses on resilience, I I'd, I'd studied the theory, but it was really the indigenous farmers, like Don Pedro here, who really taught me about the importance of first looking carefully at the knowledge, the natural resource assets, and the resilience already on the farm, if we want to keep people on landscapes with constant climate challenges. So if you want to close your eyes for a moment, and imagine the Andean highlands. They're an imposing, at times merciless range, filled with arch-backed ridges, sculpted rock faces, bright patches of green, purple, red, and gold at harvest, and ribbon-thin roads connecting villages of adobe. Their beauty can take your breath away. The altitude, too, for that matter. But their splendor reaches beyond a commanding appearance. Their indigenous residents can lay claim to one of the world's greatest shares of cultivated plants, and more particularly to the center of origin and diversity for potatoes, the world's fourth to eight most important food crop, depending on who's counting. You can open your eyes again. <laughs> so what a privilege it was to hike into my research communities on paths like this one, except when there was a vicious downpour when it turned into a bit of a river and you're up to your knees in water. But it was just an incredible privilege. And um, to study with people like these incredibly hardworking Halka farmers from Mohon. And with equipment like this, and on slopes like these, I don't know if you can tell, but those are very steep slopes. 
they were growing this kind of potato diversity. Now that's 69 pairs of morphologically distinct potatoes. Genetically, there may be more similarity. However, they have adapted to their particular eco niches on, the, on that, those hillside landscapes. This one here, however, is the big Dutch fat introduced potato, which I'll tell you a little bit more about. And for a host of very complex reasons, these potato farmers were not doing particularly well. Ironically, part of the problem and the focus of my research was that it was the development assistance they were receiving that was steadily eroding the inherent strengths of their indigenous systems. Institutions and NGOs from the political right and left had failed to varying degrees to take seriously their differing worldviews and knowledge systems. And more particularly, they ignored a centuries-old strategy called ecological complementarity. This strategy had enabled survival in places where the natural world usually has the upper hand. It was a uh, land and food production system that I consider to be, uh, after studying, incredibly resilient. Farmers, for example, some of you may have heard of doble domicilio, the idea of dual homesteading. So farmers will produce food at different altitudes, uh, growing several varieties of root, bean, and cereal crops in the highlands, and corn, wheat, and fruit crops in the valleys. And this multiplicity of lands based between highland and, and the valley ecosystems, which is often within a few days' hike, served both as a kind of adaptation to high levels of climatic risk and as an economic growth strategy. There were several other uh, very dynamic and complementary components, including a fascinating uh, governance system, uh, which I'm not going to take the time to talk to you about today. But for the sake of time, I do want to highlight an especially clever collaborative land management strategy called Manta. So in addition to their own family farms, uh, fields, each family had a community Manta. Um, so what happened there was the broader community determined the crop to be cultivated each year, the rotation cycle, the following period, um, the inputs, etc. And it was a kind of oversight that not only benefited the commons, but it also had a kind of built-in supply management um, strategy or mechanism. So the community economy could benefit. One could not sort of outdo the other. It wasn't a race for the, in some cases, the bottom or the top. Mantas and this multifaceted complementary system more broadly was an, and continues to be, in my view, uh, a resilient strategy par excellence. And so what I did is I, I sort of mapped the, and I, I'd like you to think of it a little bit as a, as a kind of lens, like a camera lens that you can, you can shift things around, the, inner, the outer circle and the inner circle. But what I discovered was a really quite a bit of synergy between the characteristics of resilience that I uh, looked at, that lens I developed, and actually their practices. It was really quite, quite amazing. Uh, but unfortunately, this ecological complementarity practice didn't seem to be very well understood by the um, external organizations working with them, and by the development community supporting them. To the contrary, dual land holding, for example, was seen as a real nuisance. You know, you'd organize a training session and the farmers would be gone to their valley lands. There was unpredictability. You couldn't really set things up the way you'd want to. So producers were encouraged to stay put, intensify production, adopt, introduce green, green revolution potatoes. I'm imagining you're familiar with, how many are familiar with the concept green revolution? Not everybody, so maybe afterwards during the, the question period we can, we can talk about that a little bit. But the idea that these were, these were potatoes that consi were considered to be um, higher yielding and more efficient, essentially. Um, but they required, on those highland, semi-arid hillsides, doses of fertilizer, pesticides, and insecticides to grow well. So. Um, they were very costly potatoes for these farmers. 
They also ignore the fact that the water content of the introduced potatoes, so look at that, you remember that big Dutch, fat Dutch one, was much higher, with protein, antioxidant, and mineral levels significantly lower. Because compared to the pot-marked, odd-shaped, purple, red, yellow, etc., potatoes, these foreign interlopers were handsome, with few blemishes. So they did, would do well in markets interested in quality control. And they had shapes that fit easily into, what do we use potatoes for? French fry machines. So most families did hold on to, um, and this is just a little simple version. <laughs> there are huge ones. They held on to at least a handful of their local varieties because um, those were the ones that they had valued for generations and they tasted better and they had an inherent sense that they were better for them. But the commercial potential for faster growing and higher yielding potatoes was too attractive to pass on. So many farmers within my study planted most of their potato fields with the introduced tubers, abandoning or neglecting up to 60% of the varieties that their ancestors had nurtured, ancestors had nurtured over generations. Commercial potato monoculture took hold with a vengeance. The competitive nature of market conditions also seems to have been overlooked. The supply increased, but surprise, surprise, the price per kilo dropped. To make up for lower unit prices, farmers had to produce more. To produce more on semi-arid soils, they needed more synthetic inputs. To purchase more inputs, they needed credit. To pay back the credit, they needed more volume. So do you see a pattern forming here, and maybe one that is reasonably familiar with, with some uh, smallholder farmers here in Canada. So farming shifted uh, from producing enough surplus um, to obtain a model lev modest level of disposable income to one of desperately trying to make credit payments. Following periods were shortened with overused fields and, and drug-addicted crops making the soils less and less fertile. And the hybrid seeds themselves started to uh, deteriorate after year two, so the farmers had to go back and buy more seed potato. The trade-off, in short, did not pay off, and in the year 2000, the average uh, family farming income among participants in the community with a 20-year history of development assistance was approximately $311, which was the average in that area, but the other communities weren't necessarily receiving um, all of that assistance. It wasn't, I concluded, what the smallholder farmers lacked that merited endorsement and, and a helping hand, but what they already had, highly threatened, yes, but sophisticated ecosystem management and resilient strategies. Thankfully, uh, while this Halka story is all too current, there are a growing number of, of ecologically sound smallholder farms that are staring the trade and aid Goliaths down, producing agroecological pra practices or practicing agroecology that, that considers that interconnected web. And not the least is, is their capacity to read their landscapes like, like you know, a, an editor would read a promising novel or book. And not only are they able to stay on their lands thanks to enhanced reproductive capacity, there's often focus on the productive capacity, but the reproductive, the idea that those lands will stay in production if they're carefully nurtured. Um, there, there are also, though, increasing yields, and there was, there is more and more um, research and peer-reviewed evidence about um, the capacity for these systems to also produce yield. A major study in, in 2004 found, within 17 African countries, found that agroecological practices in those countries actually had uh, increased yields between 50 and 100 percent. These practices, though, aren't successful because they don't use toxic chemicals. It's not just organic that's important. It, they work because they consider and value place-based and time-tested ecological knowledge from the start. That whole system 
Um, if the potato producers, whose fields you're going to see in this next slide, um, and I saw in person a couple of years ago, had planted only the potatoes from the area's research station, guess which ones they are? <laughs> the brown ones at the back. Uh, and not their frost-resistant varieties. There had been uh, hail and frost uh, two days before that, uh, before my visit. Their families would have been out of luck and uh, very hungry. Which brings me um, to sort of the last section of, of this presentation, and I think a far more hopeful story about an alternative to Trojan horse seeds and Trojan horse aid. And it's the story of my organization's Seeds of Survival program, which was the brainchild of an Ethiopian scientist, a plant genetic resource specialist, um, that grew um, from its origins in post-famine Ethiopia in the late 1980s to one that's now active in 12 countries uh, across four continents, including Canada now, and dozens of others thanks to an international training program. And it was, by the way, the, the program that launched my foray into the world of, of seeds and agricultural biodiversity work, because I was a young USC Canada program officer at the time. I worked with USC between 85 and 90 before coming back in 2004. So um, in the highlands of one of the world's biodiversity hotspots, center of origin for many of our key cereals and the exquisite bean that gets most of us through our day, what, what could that possibly be? Coffee. <laughs> <laughs> gets me through my day, I have to say. <laughs> a mid-80s drought struck with a vengeance. Consecutive years of, of low or no rainfall, and here's the important fact, within the context of a protracted civil war, caused a famine that killed hundreds of thousands of people and left um, at least a million more destitute. And the cruel irony in this tragedy was that grains in one part of the country were kept um, from the other. Most of us over 40 years of age, so I would say at least a few of us in this room, um, remember very vividly the daily television broadcasts of these hollow-eyed Ethiopian farmers. And we, we were moved to tears and, and to massive fundraising campaigns, including the first of mega celebrity concerts. The support was very well-intentioned and in many cases helpful. There were abuses like shipments of chocolate bars sent to people who could barely keep a handful of porridge down. But on balance, the assistance bore witness, I think, to our kinder and, and gentler selves. Pictures of benevolent outsiders um, soon replaced images of, of desperation in newspapers and media broadcasts around the world. But what didn't make the headlines, as it rarely does, were the efforts of Ethiopians themselves to turn things around. It's the quiet but essential local action that's always at the heart of really substantive and lasting change. During Ethiopia's mid-80s famine, Westerners grew to consider Ethiopia kind of as a basket case when it came to feeding its own people. But to the contrary, this, this center of origin with its long-standing and continued wealth of plant genetic resources and, and very knowledgeable farmers could be the breadbasket of Africa. But we first have to look very carefully at what our farmers have to offer. And that is precisely what the visionary director of the country's National <coughs> Gene Bank did in, in um, one bright morning in 1988. As the rains began to return to the country and recognizing that the country's farmers had been forced to eat their plant genetic resources, eat their future harvests, Dr. Malaku headed to farmers' fields with an idea. Could he and his institute help farmers to recover that heritage, the farmers' varieties that had been kept on, on their uh, lands, for, that they had kept on their lands for generations? The gene bank. Uh, had many of the original land races or farmers' varieties carefully stored in, in sealed packages on temperature-controlled temperature shelves, the farmers, he supposed, still had the knowledge to grow them out and essentially bring them back into their farming systems and livelihoods. Dr. Malaku knew he had a good idea, 
But when he and his staff began to work alongside the peasant farmers, they were soon extremely humbled. They discovered that some, despite a desperate hunger, had the foresight and the fortitude to actually keep some of their most precious seeds, burying them deep in their soils, as is the local tradition. They were waiting for the day when they would thrive again. Most also demonstrated a knowledge about farming systems while that, while uh, described in colloquial terms, was, was very sophisticated, rivaling some of the, the, the institute staff. I became a student all over again, Dr. Malaku told me shortly after we first met in 1988. It was time to put assumptions, indeed arrogance, about whose knowledge was superior aside and build a collaboration of the best of laboratory science with farmer science. Thanks to a Canadian researcher some of you may know, a Winnipeg chap named Pat Mooney, Word about this Ethiopia uh, work got out, attracting funding uh, from one of Canada's oldest uh, NGOs, USC Canada. Mooney named the program Seeds of Survival because it really was about survival in those days. And I think, probably given our planet's um, weary status today, maybe it is still uh, an appropriate name. The goal was and is to put farmers' skill and knowledge at the center of the struggle to end hunger. In the early days, the program's uh, attention was largely focused on, um, oops, on uh, applied farm research um, through participatory varietal seed selection techniques uh, that would help expand the number of varieties within each crop. Through participatory varietal selection, then, gene bank researchers help the farmers to select and cross for higher yield, which is important. But the farmers show the formal sector uh, specialists the much, much wider range of selection criteria they employed to meet their set of needs. They base their selection not only on uh, yield vigor, uh, but on rainfall expectations, the length of the growing season, the potential frost, drought or wind tolerance, uh, cooking considerations, how much water does it take to cook this food when water is scarce. Um, and they were concerned not only about the productivity but the hardiness and stability of the crop as well as its plasticity and that's the capacity for it to adapt to changing growing conditions. This diversity-based agriculture that we now call agrobiodiversity also meant that the farmers didn't favor the development of a single superior line, as tends to be the case in the formal system. They refused to put all their seeds <laughs> in the same basket, and nor did they want to be forced into purchases of introduced varieties that required um, synthetic inputs they couldn't, simply could not afford. Farmers' strategies and preferences were honored especially those of women farmers, since women are generally the primary seed selectors and conservers. The outcomes have been very encouraging. Fields of sorghum that once had been reduced to um, a couple of varieties at the peak of the famine have in time grown uh, into many varieties. Um, this is a farmer, Hamal, that I met in when I was there in 2006. At the peak of the famine, he had been down to three varieties, and he was up to 43 varieties uh, when I visited. The wheat used to make pasta. Do you know what particular variety that is? Indonesia. Pardon? Indonesia. Durham wheat, yes. Um, had been on the verge of extinction, and this is the center of origin for, um, for Durham wheat. And it recuperated. Families were able to eat their produce, being surplus to market, select seeds for planting that suited a broad range of performance criteria, and save enough to place a few in the community-run gene and seed banks, which is the equivalent of a safety deposit box. During the next two decades of programming, farmers, scientists, and participants from civil society organizations from around the world um, also gathered for training and knowledge exchange, returning to their homelands to set up similar programs. So you have there a representative from Bolivia, from Indonesia, from Timor-Leste, from Canada, fellow in the center, Patrick Steiner, British Columbia seed producer, Burkina Faso, uh, and Ethiopia in that particular slide. 
With time, the, the SOS program in Ethiopia spread to other partner countries. Um, those folks went home and started to incorporate um, some of the practices. And it also uh, began more and more to adopt a more comprehensive agroecology approach, um, looking at it from a farming systems perspective. So in, in addition to dis diversifying the varieties and the kinds of crops that were grown, farmers also companion plant, practice soil and water conservation, terracing, um, watershed management, reforesting barren lands, bringing, using local shrubs and local plants to bring um, soil back into production, which is incredibly important in the Sahel, in West Africa where we're working, uh, and more. And they also engage in value-added product transformation, organized marketing associations, co-ops. You know, for those of you in international development, you're recognizing the broad range of different kinds of, of activities that keep rural communities vibrant and, and robust. Last, and in, in, in no way least, they're also organizing to enhance uh, their control of their farming systems because the way they grow their food and the way they get to grow their food matters enormously. Each partnership uh, within USC Canada's International Caesar Survival Program has its own particular strengths, but I'd like to fi finish this um, presentation with a very concrete example of a program that um, in its uh, attention to the, that broad interconnected web of, uh, of um, systems that need to be considered together um, we think is working beautifully. Um, this is uh, a program that started in Honduras uh, right after Hurricane Mitch. People often think of disasters, uh, they think of loss of life which is very tragic and they think of the loss of the infrastructure but they also lose their farming systems often and their seed. So we were approached by Sally Humphreys who you see there, it's an old picture, um, uh, to um, engage in a program to help get their seeds back into their system. What's quite interesting about this program is they help establish, uh, it's a concept that did come out of, of uh, Colombia, Latin America, the CIAT, uh, of organizing farmer researcher teams. They're called Cialis. And they engage uh, in participatory plant breeding, but also uh, applied crop research. They troubleshoot together these, these communities of men and women. And the first one that you can see up here just had the men. So a real key point in strategy in, in the development of this program was to integrate women. And now they are very much uh, leaders in that program. They succeeded in crossing and breeding varieties of corn and beans that are now being distributed um, nationally through the, uh, lo the, um, the government of Honduras. Um, and they're more wind tolerant. Honduras actually is the um, first to third, depending, it changes uh, every year, most disaster prone country in the world. They just happen to be in one of those spaces. And so this kind of work is really, really, really important for these farmers. Um, they've also succeeded in reducing the number of hunger days. The beauty of, of having been able to work with Sally and her doctoral students is that we actually have good data. Um, we actually can, you know, it's very hard for NGOs to do the kind of consistent uh, data gathering um, to, to really uh, show impact. We're not, we don't have the resources often to do that. But when you work in partnership with the university, it can be very helpful. And so they did a study in 2004 and found that at that time, the hunger days, which are actually called Los Junios. Junios is the month of June. So they've, they've been named after the, the, the months where there's just very little to eat. And usually they actually extend it into July. So, so there was about a 5.6 week period where there was very little to eat. And that was reduced as of 2004 to to 1.3 today when we visit, um, and we do need to repeat that study, we no longer hear complaints about hunger days. Farmers are problem solving together, they're sharing and testing long-standing practices as well as integrating and innovating. And I really want to stress that. Oftentimes we get accused of, oh, you're just trying to keep this sort of little romantic niche kind of work happening. Um, 
and is not seen as modern, is not seen as moving forward, these systems are very dynamic and very, very innovative. Lest I seem to be suggesting, however, that uh, everyone gets to live happily ever after as this approach uh, spreads, um, farming to their heart's desire in ways that build seed and food sovereignty, uh, the pushback to such agroecological approaches from external actors with differing views and thoughts about food security is very strong. Big aid and trade dollars continue to be targeted for Western-style training programs and packages of laboratory seeds and chemicals, inputs that still arrive on those very same um, hun Honduran hillsides, including GMO corn. Participants in an intergovernmental meeting in Rome in 2008 that brought, finally, at long last, greater global attention to, um, to the need to pay attention to rural communities and farming livelihoods, etc., welcomed attention in that sense, still um, called for the governments to produce, to purchase improved or modern seeds and fertilizers since, and I quote, the lack of improved inputs is the single most important factor in the continued poor yields in smallholder farming. And this message remains the dominant message, certainly it prevails in uh, the deliberations of the Committee on World Food Security in Rome, of which uh, I regularly attend. When speaking informally to a USDA uh, official a little over a year ago, a colleague, a researcher friend of mine, uh, discovered that it costs approximately $136 million to produce a single genetically modified crop variety. So let's pretend that someday soon that particular variety will be incredibly, incredibly resilient. It would still represent just one tiny piece of a much broader undertaking in the struggle to build broad-based, climate-resilient food systems and vibrant rural communities. This whole Honduran program that you're staring at receives 68 times less in funding than the cost of that single genetically modified plant. And forgotten within the dominant discourse is the fact that it has been peasant farmers that have actually showed the most innovation over time. Over the last 40 years, formal sector plant breeders have released 8,000 new crop varieties, which sounds pretty impressive. The majority of them are ornamental plants. But by contrast, small holder farmers, peasant farmers, indigenous farmers have bred and contributed to the national gene banks around the world, more than 1.9 million plant varieties. But the core question is, again, who is benefiting and who is in control? And the struggle is for farms and markets of a scale that permit existing resilience to thrive or to blossom once again. Greater local ownership of what and how food is produced and of the stewardship practices that work with nature and not against it are really critical first steps. Scale matters. Who recognizes this crop? How many of you drink beer? Be honest. <laughs> so what is it? Barley. barley. Well, this is actually Ethiopian barley, a variety of Ethiopian barley. It's not the one, but it was Ethiopian barley that actually um, saved the beer industry in North America. A mid-1970s rust uh, threatened the whole entire North American crop, and they went back to Ethiopia and to a scientist there to find the gene that saved the day. So the next time you're having a beer, you know, if you have a beer tonight to celebrate your day, remember to toast our Ethiopian farmer friends. The production and celebration of food from seed to spoon and soil to plate is gathering women and men from different classes, regions, races, ethnic backgrounds, from both rural and urban landscapes, from formal institutions and civil society organizations, and from the global south and the north. And it's also growing in leaps and bounds right here in Canada. And this is some happy news. We actually were able to get a grant from the Weston Foundation to do some work with farmers in Canada 
small scale family farmers who are wanting to get local seed, adapted seed, into their systems. And I was recently at a conference, a North American conference, the Orga Organic Seed Alliance Conference, gave a talk and asked the participants in this program to stand up. It was a group of about 500 um, people, and at least, I'd say, a quarter of the room stood up. They were Canadians who are very much engaged in this program, and we felt really good about the fact that this is really growing in our own country. This multi-layered collaborative food movement is, in my books, our most hopeful attempt to rebuild our planet's resilience and well-being, the well-being of its citizens, as well as of the natural resources, animals, etc., that we once had in abundance. In the words of author Arundhati Roy, another world is not only possible, she is on her way. On a quiet day, I can hear her breathing. Thank you.